Welcome everybody back to another, yes, I keep saying it, another episode of the Hit in the Turnbuckle podcast. I'm your host, Andy Burrows, and as you can see, I'm joined by my illustrious co-host, good friend and tag team partner, Mr. Adam Cousins. Adam, how are you, sir? Good evening, mate. Uh, well, I'm all right in a minute. I've just come off a podcast with a wrestler that we are going to be seeing in July, uh, Taylor James, uh, in, in the event that we're putting on <clears throat> with Ignite. Uh, he just, I just announced his opponent live on the podcast well, not live but nice. on the podcast Ooh. reaction was interesting when i told him that he was taking on michael a coup yeah um, <laughs> what a wrestler to take on yeah. that, mate. but anyway other than that i'm fine but anyway <laughs> you're always good to hear mate always good to hear uh we have been pulling some great guests out recently adam uh mm-hmm. We might have topped ourselves today, mate. Uh, every oh, week, <laughs> every week I say, well, not literally. Every week I say, you are the king of the intro, my oh, friend. Man. Who <laughs> is our amazing guest today? Well, our amazing guest today has been uh, a wrestling personality for probably just over ten years, maybe a bit, maybe a bit longer. Uh, she's been in TNA, and the best part about it now, she lives over in jolly old England with us. He's so one of it- us now. So it makes the time difference a hell of a lot better than what we've had in the past. Um, so it, it it gives us great pleasure. Uh, so Calval, good evening. Hello, thank you for having me. One of us, one of us. Well, you are Val, one of us. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to come on uh, come on the podcast. I know how how busy you are. Um, as Adam mentioned there, before we get into all things wrestling, you are pretty much based in the UK now, right? I mean, um. I've I've seen you here. I met you at Apex a couple of weeks ago. You do I think you're uh, every Comic Con I see. You are literally like one of the busiest women on the planet. But how did you end up in the in the UK? Well, beautiful exotic Milton Keynes. I mean, how could I say no? You know, my sister lives in London, so I was visiting. Uh, I've lived here for about almost seven years now, and I was visiting London. The thing is, what's so interesting about living here is it's not that it just happened on a whim. I, I've always loved England. I love you know the history, the architecture, the monarchy, all of that, and I always studied as studied it as a kid. And then when I started to visit my sister in London. Um, I started to do some shows here. I did like um, wrestle talk when it was way back in the day. Oh, yeah. I did different things, um, show masters, autograph signing, things like that. And then I met my husband who is from Stony Stratford and he owned a pub at hey, the time. That's where I was born. Well, near where I was born. Yeah, there you go. Oh my God. See, small world. It's like a family reunion here. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I just was talking to him recently. Um, D'Lo Brown and Rockstar Spud and I were brought into a an autograph signing with Steve Linsky, who booked us. And we went to a pub that I remember thinking, God, this is really far. Like, I just, I'm happy to just go to Subway by the hotel. And we went to this pub and I'm so glad that I did because I met my husband who owned the pub at the time and we just hit it off. And um, weirdly enough, he had met MVP before me, who I've known since I was like 16 years old. So he met a couple wrestlers because they were bringing them when they were in town for Comic Con. And uh, yeah, so we got married. Uh, our six year anniversary was late February of this year. So I've been living here for almost seven years and oh. it's it's been quite a journey, but it's, I'm very well suited to England, especially the weather. I love the weather. <laughs> I love uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, you, it, our weather takes some getting used to. Uh, you mentioned the monarchy there. I saw you live tweeting during the coronation. That was one yes. of the, I was more interested in your tweets than I was the coronation. I thought they were tremendous. We should have had you hosting the BBC. Uh, I think someone tweeted you that. They would like to see you hosting the BBC. But I'm so I don't glad know that... if my unfiltered opinions would have been uh, presumably maybe not would not have gone so well. I also like I'm such a bubbly person. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so excited. Like that does not go very well here in England. I've noticed um, we kind of had that reputation of being sort of loud and bubbly and like overexcited, which I'm like, totally, that's me. I, that's just who yeah. I am. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'm the same person that I woke up at like three in the morning to watch the Will and Kate wedding. And I love all that. I had China, like, you know, my, my tea set and my crown on. Like, I love that kind of stuff. And I thought you was, um, I, sorry to interrupt. I thought you were starting a joke then. You went, me, Dilo Brown, and Rockstar Star walked into a pub. That is a we typical did. way. And then I found a husband. <laughs> the, the joke's on me. I found a husband out of it. But yeah, so I, I love, I love British culture and, you know, I would never get into the politics. So I hope that no one would get into oh, the politics. No, the even we don't get into that. Oh. Yeah. But the coronation and stuff, it was it was pomp and circumstance and everything I love about wrestling. It was sparkly and over the damn top. I loved it. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was I'm not a royalist myself, but I took great yeah. enjoyment of seeing you live tweeting throughout the coronation. Yes. I thought it was good. Uh, Val, we always start our interviews uh, with our wrestling guests uh, with the same question. What do you think of the current wrestling product in 2023? Oh, good question. Um. You know, the older I get, and I am older now, I mean, I started when I was 16, I'm now 37. 
So I, you know, I have my, everyone has their favorite era, right? So let's just start there. Everyone has their era. They go, oh my God, you meet someone from the eighties that goes, oh, it's never going to be like that. My era, you know, Mach and everybody and Flair um, or the seventies, whatever, whatever your era was. But for me, you know, I started to get like heavily into it around like 99, 2000, right? So like that era for me was untouchable. That's the creed, my sacrifice era. That's my jam. I have my favorites from that era. So I have a very um, specific type of wrestling that I like. I do miss sort of the diva era. I think sometimes women's wrestling, for example, can take itself a little too seriously. I think wrestling in general takes itself too seriously sometimes. I miss a little more of the comedic aspect. Um, so th if I can say anything negative about it, I would say sometimes it gets a little too serious for mm -hmm. my liking. I miss some of the fluff of when I was around watching as, as a you know, 13, 14 year old girl. Um, but my gosh, but, but the positives from it is just the the progression of diversity and the progression of featuring females in, in a more serious way. You know, my thing with that is like, I love that they're featuring the females more. I just kind of miss the managers, you know, kind of mm. era. That's one thing I, I miss mm. a lot. Uh, tag team wrestling is not kind of where it used to be when I was watching that, for example, but they're still mm. featuring the women in a great way, in a very po body positive way, diversity of, of, you know, races and different things like that. Um, also the types of matches they've come up with in the last like five, 10 years have been really interesting and innovative. Um, so yeah, I, I think we're going in the right direction, but I think with that great power, if I can do a Spider-Man reference comes great responsibility. And I think sometimes just like everything, when we're trying to be progressive, sometimes we take it a little too seriously. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the only gripe that I have. I kind of miss even like Royal Rumble, the last several that I've watched, I'm like, where are the legends? Where's the silliness? Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of like that, that fluff aspect, because for me, wrestling and anything I watch now, hello, RuPaul's Drag Race, anything I watch is an escape. <laughs> and sometimes with wrestling, I'm like, okay, so it's been seven serious matches. And I'd like to see, like at WrestleMania, I went and watched the, um, the Jackass match yes. last year. And honestly, I was like, I don't know what this is. It was such a palate cleanser and so much fun that I was like, okay, now I'm ready for another serious match. Cause I had yeah. a little bit of fun. Right. So mm -hmm, yeah. that diversity and that sort of um, yin and yang, I think is a nice balance. And I'd like to see more of that. We need mm. some more legends in the Royal Rumble when we go in January, Andy. Yeah, I'm praying that we see some legends when we go. Um, yeah. Where's but, Steve Blackman? Who's who's seen Steve? Like, where is the guy? I love him so much. Mm. Every year I'm hoping for him. And that's in Orlando, by the way. So I will be there with you guys. Is it oh, really? Is that, it's been announced yet? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, I remember I said to you last week, uh, it's like, oh, no, we yeah, have to go to Orlando. Oh, yeah. what a shitter. Um, Val, obviously you mentioned the era that you liked watching when you were growing up, but... What brought you to the business? Obviously, like you said, Adam said at the start, you've been involved in TNA. You're heavily involved over here now in the UK. You've worked with some great wrestling promotions. But what is a young girl in America? How does she get involved in professional <laughs> wrestling? What was the light bulb moment for you that you thought, do you know what? I want to get involved in this industry. You know what's funny? It's, it's funny. As I just told this story a couple of days ago because someone was playing Creed, My Sacrifice on the jukebox. Oh, I said, that was my tune. moment. What a so tune, I... by the way. That that's my that's my jam, and I'll play it on the jukebox at the pub, and I'm just like, oh, wrestling get a bit jaded. And I'm like, oh, I've been in it too long, and then I'm like, oh my god, I love wrestling because of that song and that montage. So what's funny about that is, so I was just a huge fan, like obsessed, obsessed with wrestling and the Hardys and Edge and Christian and you know Trish and mainly Stephanie McMahon, who's my personal Jesus, still is. <laughs> um, Triple H is still my favorite of all time. We'll get to that later. But the point is, I was obsessed, and like you know, I was living in LA at the time. And I was really annoyed by the fact that we got everything later, you know, because we're on Pacific time. And um, I was in RPGs. I was on message boards. Like I was, I could not eat, drink, sleep, and breathe wrestling enough. And uh, I started to go to local independent shows. I was 16. I was barely 16 at the time. And uh, some of my friends were with me. They were always older than me. My mom said, you know what? If you're going to go, you have to have someone with you that's older. And you know, just for protection, it's, it's they're in seedy areas as independent wrestling shows sometimes are. <laughs> especially downtown Los Angeles. God bless. Uh, you know, <laughs> thank you very much. You got to be careful out there. So I went to some indie shows and my friends knew a promoter and he goes, you know, she really wants to be involved. She'd love to just manage someone. Could you put her on the show? And my first show was three days after my 16th birthday, which was March 30th, 2002. And I managed uh, Scott Lost and I turned on him for, at the time he was called Panoy Boy. You would know him now as TJ Perkins. Oh. And uh, Frankie Kazarian was on the show. Uh, Daniels was on my, I think, second or third show. But I just kept consistently doing shows and just trying to be involved and eventually moved back to Orlando where I lived before. And then Impact Wrestling or TNA at the time, I still call it TNA, was yeah. there. I would show up to every TV taping with my little resume, my little VHS tape, ready to, if whoever I can talk to, like I'd love to be a part of the show. I live here. You know, can I be a part of it? 
And, you know, they hired me as first a production assistant because one of the producers said, I know you want to be on the show, but if you can help backstage, it's a way to get your foot in the door. Then I got to be ring girl. Then I got to be hosting and doing what I do now. But it was a very um, long process. And, you know, for me doing indies for about three years and never getting paid, I think I, got, I made like $10 once on a, a show. They gave me gas money in three years, um, getting my mom to drive me around. So it was it was a long process with indies and doing indies the whole time I was in TNA as well. So, you know, the mm -hmm. whole nine years I was in, in TNA, I was doing indie shows. So it wasn't something where, with all due respect to girls, it just sort of go, oh, I had a modeling contest and I was there. That's all well and good. And there's that's respect of, of how you get in. As long as you get in it and respect the business, cool. But for me, it was really coming from the ground up and doing indies that got me to the big dance, which was getting signed to Impact Wrestling at 18. Mm, yeah. Wow. Great. That's amazing. Uh, I'm sorry, Mike. Really, really. Just, I'm just segueing because of the story that we always tell about Impact Wrestling, because the last time up until... April of this year, the last time me and you saw each other was the Maximum Impact Tour 2011. I worked it. It was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yes, and that summer. was, what do we do? Um, It was at Manchester, Wem London, Manchester and London. Uh, Wembley. Edinburgh? No. Uh, yeah, yeah we, was in, we was in Wembley in London. We went to the Wembley, yeah. the one with Hogan and Bischoff. They brought and... a lockdown cage for it. They did. And that's when I remember Drew was at one of those shows and it was, it was, it was the old gang. It was Samoa Joe, it was Ken Anderson, it was Matt Hardy, like it was all of us. And uh, yeah, I remember distinctly about Wembley every time I hear the name Wembley I kind of get like a little <laughs> little PTSD because one of our friends Vikram who is a, a big friend of progress he comes to progress sometimes um he told me that I guess on on the mic I had been saying over and over that we're at Wembley Stadium <laughs> and we're at Wembley, Wembley Arena, Arena. And he yeah. goes, you did a great job, but, and I was like, well, I don't have a time machine. Like now I can't go back. I had, <laughs> why didn't anyone tell me? I feel like an idiot, but oh, well. Yeah. You know, Just sidetracking. We're using the word Wembley. Uh, T uh, TNA, now you got me saying it. Uh, all Elite Wrestling uh, are all in uh, at Wembley Stadium. Yes. Wembley Stadium. Um, ballsy move, do you think, to, to first show? Because obviously they was meant to come over here. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, just before yeah. the pandemic, they were going to do Fire Fest over here, I believe. Yeah. Uh, probably at Fulham's ground, I would imagine. Um, do you think it was a really ballsy move then trying to book the stadium? Because obviously people know about it. It's on free TV over here and they're always getting this rap online, you know, not going to sell the tickets. Well, they've sold 65,000 at the moment, so they can't yeah. be doing too bad. Um, do you think it was quite a ballsy move then booking that as a first show in the UK? 1000%. <clears throat> and I would say a risk in a way, but I'll tell you what really changed my mind about it. Um, so I just hosted um, Comic Con with Monopoly events. So I work for full time. Yeah. Great. That's where all the Comic Cons that I work for. And one particular Comic Con that is very easy for me to do with no research and no notes to be made, thank God, is For the Love of Wrestling, yeah. which is all wrestling characters, right? So yeah. um, we had AEW people there. Now, some of them I knew, like Ruby Soho, I had done Shine with many times. Uh, she's lovely. Adam Cole's a buddy of mine. Um, I knew quite a few of them, but some of them I did not know, like Jungle Boy, Anna Jay. Um, and the response that I saw to them, and if you don't believe me, there if you go on YouTube, and I, hopefully you're already here on YouTube, and hopefully, by the way, subscribe to this show, make sure you're doing all that, liking and all that. Um, but when you're on YouTube, go ahead and check out some of the panels that we did, the Q&A panels, because Adam Cole, who works a room like no one I've ever <laughs> seen in my life, is the most professional. I could, I could spend an hour on the, the, the beauty that is Adam Cole. Amazing dude. But... Um, the response to Adam Cole and all the AEW folks that were there, I, I want to say kids, because to me, I know that they're not that much younger than me, but I feel like they are. Um, their response was so massive mm -hmm. that I went, this is why they're going to do so well. My goodness. FTR was, the, I mean, I there's so it. many younger, I see younger, you know, because we had like Booker T and the Dudleys, people that are doing it a lot longer of a time. Um, but the response to the AEW folks was so insane that I went, this is going to go real well and when they mentioned Wembley who's going everyone's hand shot up in the air so I mean they're gonna they're gonna completely crush it they're gonna smash it and I think just like Impact when they were on such a high which I was so thrilled to be there during that time um you know it's it's an alternative but it's also just a cool way to have wrestling be more mainstream and AEW's done a really good job of um promoting themselves internationally so I I wish the best for them I will hopefully be there with Wrestle Tours and the Progress Group and Hooked on Wrestling, all my friends there, just to see it live. I mean, Jay Lethal, for example, I was just talking to him about <laughs> it over here. You yeah. know, hey, old habits die hard. What can you say? Exactly. So um, I, I'd be happy to see him and to see them on such a grand stage would be really, really phenomenal. And my God, even though I know the guy, he's hired me for Jericho Cruz and he's my buddy and professionally and personally, I love him. But Chris Jericho, my God, he's done such an amazing job and he is just the total package. And for him to 
see this kind of success over here is really, really cool to see as, as a friend personally, but also just as a fan of his, I've been a fan of his mm. for, yeah, since I was yeah, like, yeah. you know, 12, 13 years old. Yeah. I mean, a- AEW gets compared to impact a lot uh, yeah. in recent times. Um, I was, when impact kind of reinvented itself, uh, they, you know, they, they went, went on Monday nights and the, the, it was really booming. Obviously you played such a role in the history, I still call it impact TNA impact. I still call it TNA yeah. now. I, I, yeah. you know, I, um, what do you think went right about that company? But also, what do you think went wrong with it? Because I thought what I see AEW doing now, I chat to fans that don't even know about impact. I'm like, we've had this before, and that makes you feel old, right? You're yeah, like, it makes oh, me okay. feel really old because <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I remember watching impact on, I think it was on Bravo over here for a while. Um, I think it was something like Challenge TV, sorry, it was on Challenge, Challenge TV, Challenge. but and I absolutely loved it I, from from its very from when it very started with AJ Styles and the X Division, and then they then they try to go what I call big big time Hogan Bischoff Dixie Carter had an announcement every single week yeah what do you think went right about the company but also and also from your experience of being there why is yeah. impact not the same company it is now that it was when you were there I can't pinpoint you know as far as like a financial like a business plan type of a thing and I, and I would never pretend to know that but I will say the biggest misconception for me is I meet everybody and it, it 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 actually genuinely personally irks me when someone and I hear it all the time they go oh yeah it was great but then Hogan and Bischoff came in and blah 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 yeah, and it like, wasn't just them but without signing rude if you weren't the, if, if you were there mm. anyone that was there will tell you that Hogan and Bischoff were a great thing that happened to the company and they yeah. are not nearly anywhere near at fault of anything bad happening uh, did Hogan they just get misused the do, you do you think they got misused Hogan and Bischoff when they were there and they were the scapegoats. Me? Or, so, no, no, sorry. Do you think Hogan oh. and Bischoff, when they were in TNA, got misused? Because they, you know what I mean? I thought they were great acquisitions. I loved them. They were great. Um, but I'm, people I'm were like, Hogan oh, they're going to ruin it. For they're sure. going to run it out of town. It's going to be WCW. And I I'm find like, that so odd. I, I mean, when Hogan and Bischoff were there, things were running so well. They did so much for the company. Mm. And again, I hate to say it, but anyone that kind of says that they were the problem, I'm like, dude, you weren't there. Like, yeah. without being rude. Dixie Carter, I'm sure, you know, will admit that there were things that were done uh, business-wise that – could have been better. I mean, that's true with any business, but Hogan and Bischoff coming in, putting us on ESPN, putting us on the map yeah. and, and just, just the way that they handled themselves, handled the employees, they were phenomenal. And and that was my kind of favorite time mm. is, is when they were there. I mean, I, I, I was even just in my own small little way, like the way that Hogan and Bischoff were complimentary to me and were, were taking the time to see all the intricacies of what I was doing, what's going on backstage, what social media was doing. Um, That was really overlooked before they got there. And for people to kind of just, weirdly to pinpoint that they were the problem again you weren't there and 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 mm. i am a huge proponent of, of what they were doing I, I really supported them and then i left kind of around the time when like big um john my the name's escaping me um Gaburuk, i believe it is uh so i can't say i ever i worked with him he was nice when i met him i, I it was literally one of the last shows i ever did was when he came in and was being introduced to people um but yeah i think that the issue there were a lot of issues with kind of like promoting like for example we did house shows i was on house shows excuse me live events for a very long time and there was a lot of problems with like marketing you know a lot of people didn't know we were in town so little things like that where they were dropping the ball on certain things but primarily um you know when hogan and bischoff were there that was when it was really kind of hot and that was getting mm. exciting and they had the Brooke hogan aces and eights angle and yeah well, I, I loved it the best loved television it. we ever did so for me that is one big misconception that the hogan and era sorry yeah. hogan and bischoff era was a problem and i'm like dude that was when things were going really well and things were just working better backstage mm. as well. you've got you've oh, got sorry. two of the sorry mate just, just finish up yeah. you've got two of the greatest wrestling minds ever. of course bischoff and hogan the thing i always thought with somewhere like impact and i hope it doesn't happen to AEW, is when non-wrestling people try to make wrestling decisions totally that for me is when i go and you hear the stories of WCW back when that's, you know, that was TV executives and you hear, of all, you know, hear of all these kind of stories. And I've heard many stories. Of, I loved TNA Impact. I really did. But when I hear that it's non-wrestling people trying to come in and that's make worrisome. wrestling, of course. that is worse than anything Bishop and Hogan could do, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 and it's weird because again, people and, and, you know, fans from fans coming up to me and saying, Hey, I have this great idea. Will you tell Dixie? I'm like, no, that's, <laughs> no, I can't. I but also, and, and with all to, 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 to credit Dixie, I mean, she did a lot of great things too. But again, it's very difficult, like you said, for someone without having any idea of wrestling to come in and kind of, mm. you know, steer the ship. 
as opposed to Hogan and Bischoff. And Bischoff was a genius, is a genius. So for me, I'm very much Hogan and Bischoff uh, yeah, I supporters. And I, I find it very funny that when people, people like, I mean, all the time come up and go, well, this is what they should have done. And Hogan and Bischoff ruined it. And I was like, okay, so during that time, were you at the shows or what were you doing? Mm, yeah. So that I find that very funny. Oh, uh, no, yeah, that's it, very interesting know? to hear. Yeah. Do you Go ahead, think, sorry, sorry, no, do, do you think I mean, one of the things? That, well, again, we, we're just fans. We have an opinion. We don't know what goes on. You know, obviously, we we, we we wouldn't portray that we did. I think one of the things that I wouldn't say irked me, but I felt as if a little bit with TNA that they kind of lost the identity of what brought them to the dance in the first place. So if you've got like, yes, AJ was still there and he was still doing well, but you had all these other guys, Daniels, Joe, you know, Frank is there, and yeah. you had all these other guys, and it just felt at one point that they was. Focusing more on people that were released from the WWE, maybe to, try, maybe to try and bring more, you know, more eyes, eyes on, on the, the price, product, so to yeah. speak. But for me, when I started, sort of my interest dwindled when they started doing that, and they kind of forgot like the low keys and the, the people yeah. that you know literally got them to where they were today. <clears throat> very, very, very fair assumption, and I totally agree because the thing is, like you know, a little bit of that we were talking about diversity, right before. Yeah. And a little bit of that, like, you know, when, when Flair came in, oh, my God, when Angle came in and Christian, yeah. all these people, and they did amazing things. But at the same time, there should be a balance of both. And I think for mm -hmm. sure that's when people start to get made fun of. We're getting made fun of, like, oh, it's a WWE graveyard. And I'll tell you something, as, as far as somebody who was there, did it bother all the TNA original guys? Of course it did. Mm -hmm. Really did. Yeah. And if I were them, it would bother me, too. Um, I can't speak as a wrestler. You know, I was never mm -hmm. a wrestler. That was so fun for me to be in the locker room just to kind of hear, hear the drama <laughs> but not be a part of it because I'm not threatening anyone's job. I'm just Val that's... Yeah ring girl interviewer you know host ring announcer type gal but um but yeah i think that definitely bothered the guys when it got to be so out of touch that just anyone that was released come on over yeah. and i think i think if they were a little more careful about that balance that would have been nicer because you know people like christian cage who was i think underrated in wwe for a oh, while oh, kind of oh, my edge. I his face. i love jay he's amazing he's, he's so by the way so funny one of the <laughs> driest humors like he doesn't speak much but when he does it's effing hilarious. But he um he was somebody who came to TNA and I think th thought it was a cool thing because he kind of got to shine in his own way. Yeah, and yeah. um so that was a great acquisition. They're all great acquisitions, but when you have so many, then yeah, then then your, the original guys get lost in the shuffle. The Bobby Roods, who is my God, one of the best wrestlers I've ever seen yeah. in my life. We're living in the generation that we get to see Bobby Roode and Kurt Angle wrestle all the time. Like, wow, yeah. favorite matches ever in TNA. Um but yeah, they, they were losing sight of the Frankie Kazarians, the Bobby Roods, the Eric Youngs, AJ, Samoa Joe, um, all the X Division guys. Um, so yeah, I think they did lose sight of that a little bit. That happens with every company. It's sort of like the shiny X WWE guy comes in and that's great. But I think a balance of both would have been preferable to just anyone come on over and let's just push them and then have yeah. the other TNA guys go back here. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I think TNA did do really well uh, was elevate women's wrestling because but people can say yeah. that, you know, WWE can say, oh, it started with, you know, Paige and it started with Charlotte Flair's and Natasha Banks's. But in fairness, and, and we've got her on in a couple of weeks, uh, it was actually a month today, we've got Angelina Love coming on, uh, on yeah. here. I can't wait for that. But it, it, it's the likes of, you know, the beautiful people and, and people like that that, they were amazing con gal kim you know all of those type of women that realistically the women's revolution started there it just wasn't on the platform that it you know in terms of viewers or if you could do things now like twitch or tiktok or insta where you can now you know i always say to this thing now is and i hate using this analogy but you can literally go to the bathroom and, and watch wrestling on your phone and yeah. i think perhaps if you know if that sort of stuff was around now people would understand that the women's revolution actually started at impact or TNA. Yeah. I will 100% agree with that. And, that, and that's, you know, I, I did an interview with the son who horribly misquoted me. I was just saying that like, you know, we're oh, shock. A, it's we're, the son. Uh, shocker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Another, breaking another, news. another breaking news. <laughs> yeah. The son is hot. I mean, breaking yeah. news. Yeah. So they, uh, they misquoted me by saying, I was like, you know, I just was taking up for our girls and saying that, you know, our girls are great, but the, the, the misquote was something about how we're better than the WWE girls. And it's like, that's not what I was saying. I was just agreeing with what you just said that like, we really did start to push our girls and the knockout division more than WWE was doing at the time yeah. and whatever. It doesn't, really, does it matter at the end of the day? It doesn't matter. It just, as long as people were pushing women's wrestling and now look what in a great space that we're in, but yeah, the knockouts were totally, um, a, a an effort made by girls that you know most of those girls were were homegrown TNA talent or independent talents. They were not you know ex WWE girls, which again, it, not knocking them at all. We had Christy Hemi and Gail Kim who were you know former WWE girls, but a, a lot of the times they were not used in the way they wanted to be used there, which is think is everyone's you know obviously they agree with that. 
but yeah, the, the knockouts were doing things, you know, Taryn Terrell and Gail Kim. I remember a cage match they did. Yeah. Um, Gail Kim is one of the best awesome wrestlers song. ever. Yeah. And it just, just things like that that were happening. I was like, wow. And they were putting the spotlight where it deserves. And, and I'm sure we'll get into progress, but progress reminds me of that in the way that the first show that I did was an all female show. When I say all female show, by the way, it was not just, okay, it's all female matches. The commentary team, myself and Jade, were, were female. The referees were female. The ring announcer was female. There was not one dude on the show other than in the crowd, which, not to be exclusive, but it was just a really cool thing. And, and that's why I'm so proud that that was my first foray into progress wrestling. When you talk about being progressive, pun intended, that's something that they really do that I kind of, it kind of harkens back to those early knockout days where I go, wow, they're not putting women's matches on the card just because they feel like they need to. They're putting mm -hmm. one or two matches on the card because these girls are so damn good. They deserve it. And, that, and that's what I love about progress is they really genuinely believe in the females and in impact. It was the exact same way. It's still going on now with impact, you know, Giselle Shaw, yeah. they have all these amazing talents, you know, Mickey's there still, my gosh, Jordan Grace. There's so yeah. many amazing girls there. And it's not just a, we're going to phone it in because we're told we need to have more women's matches. They are nurturing the careers of these girls and putting a spotlight on them. That's so well-deserved and it is beyond amazing to see. Mm. Obviously, Val, no, you I'm mentioned... gonna cry, damn it! You, yeah, you Melina yes. cried. Stop we're it. Sick. We've done two. We've got two. Just... Oh. We shouldn't be proud of this, but we are. We know. Um, oh, yeah. Val, um, should have made a real drink after this. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, go and get a vodka and coke or something. Um, Val, you mentioned progress there. Obviously, um, you're heavily involved uh, in the independent scene in the UK. Um, myself and Adam have really got into the independent scene uh, in the last six or seven months. Uh, we're, we're quite heavily involved with Ignite. Uh, we're, we're coming to the Apex show this weekend. Um, from when you first got here to where we are now, has the independent scene in the UK surprised you? Because we mentioned all the time in this podcast, growing up, you're, you're kind of thrown into WWF, WCW. That's all you know. Yeah. Since the internet's come along and social media, there's access to absolutely everything. Now, you can sign up for Progress. You can watch all their shows. You can go and watch it. There's a local show pretty much every weekend. How uh, how much do you think the independent scene in the UK plays a part in wrestling now? Did it, And has it surprised you from coming across from the States when you first got here to seeing where it is now? Because you're you're heavily involved in the UK independence. Okay. I think, and, I, I'm, and, I'm gonna be because because we're all friends here. I'm gonna be super super blunt and super honest. So and I hope that's how I always come across. So of course. when I moved here, you know, after I, I was left Impact in like 2013, I was talking to WB a little bit about maybe working for them, and I, I did some extra work, whatever. And it just so happened that I ended up moving to England. And I was like, okay, so maybe this is a sign, right? So the WB thing hasn't really officially happened yet. Moving to England, I was like, okay, so I'm really going to try to do other presenting work for, I was doing some fashion weeks, and I still hope to do more of that. That's great. Comic cons eventually happen. But I remember thinking, my God, I come over here to not get away from wrestling per se, but to just sort of, you know, I don't know, sort of, no, the scene <laughs> exploded. I'm not taking responsibility for it at all. I'm just saying the timing was hysterical because I came over here and it was like, oh my God, wrestling has just blown up. Then there's NXT UK, then Progress, and I, you know, the, the Progress is there. The first shows I did here, I think, were PCW, Preston City Wrestling, Southside, yeah. a couple like that. And then what's funny about Progress is Progress was always, I always heard, just, and again, just being super blunt as an American, Progress was always the number one company over here. It's just what mm -hmm. I was always told. It just made sense. And when I came over here, I, I kind of had reached out and kind of said, like, hey, guys, I'm here, whatever. And it was kind of a cold I'm not, I don't know who it was. I'm just being honest. It seemed very much like a boys club, like an exclusive. We're underground. And, you know, I, I'm the opposite of an underground, cool, edgy company. I'm, I'm the least ECW gal you'll ever meet. I just said this mm -hmm. to Bubba Ray Dudley. He agreed, by the way, not long ago. I am the shiny American bubbly, you know, girly girl. So I was like, maybe it's not a, it's not a, a maybe it's a bit of a disconnect. And what I'd love to see, especially with progress is that they're now sort of, progressing yes pun intended into this sort of more inclusive again not taking themselves as seriously type of thing there's still that edge that coolness you know we do all of the shows or most of the shows in um in Camden at the electric ballroom that's my favorite venue because it's just such a fun like raucous crowd but there's less of that and I, I hate to say it but I'm gonna say it because again we're being honest PWG uh, companies I was mm -hmm. commissioner of PWG for a while I was there for years um, some of these companies, especially being a girl and not just being a girl, but being a very diva, girly girl, kind of shiny, you know, I'm not a wrestler that's tough. I'm very girly. 
Um, that sometimes is really a, a turnoff for someone that's of my girly, not so serious, bubbly aspect. And with progress and PWG with that, I think they start to get into the idea that, okay, so we want to be the company that the guy who is edgy and cool can bring his girlfriend to that's never seen wrestling. And I've had so many of my personal friends come to progress that are not at all involved with wrestling. Some of them are songwriters. Some of them are, you know, bar our owners, whatever the MK11 guys have been with me before. And they, what, what their takeaway is from progress, especially is like, yes, they like the serious matches. Sure. But we were talking about diversity. I'm going back to that again. They like the, the Crowleys of the group. They like the Millie McKenzie's of the group. They like the Nina Samuels and her crazy, you know, her, the Nina Samuels show. They, they take away certain commercial type aspects from it that the otherwise, and I'm sorry to say it, sometimes a jaded wrestling fan that's so used to this underground, we're tough. It, it has to appeal to all people. And I think that's what I'm seeing with progress. It's appealing to more diverse, uh, diverse people, more diverse groups. Um, a lot of, I see a lot more females in the crowd. Every show I say that I see more females mm -hmm. in the crowd that are bringing their girlfriends like that. Like no offense, even total divas. A lot of girls didn't like wrestling before. You know what totals diva to, total divas on E was something that went like, wow, okay, it's like me who loves Real Housewives. These are girls who are wrestlers. <laughs> so now I'm interested in wrestling. So not to compare progress to Total Divas, but in the sense that it's appealing to people that maybe never thought about wrestling before. And mm -hmm. that to me is how you get a company that's, you know, going to sustain themselves and, and go even bigger than they are now because everyone's included. No one's too cool. No one's using lingo. Nobody understands. Like, Wrestling should be inclusive. And we're seeing so much more of that. Look at, you know, Effie's Big Gay Brunch was just here in the UK. Yeah. I want to see more of that. And I'm seeing so much more of it. And that's how it's evolved for me, even coming from like about seven, eight years ago, that yeah. I'm seeing more inclusivity. And that's so cool to see. Yeah, it is really mm -hmm. cool. Really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think like the talent, I mean, we, me and Andy say, me and Andy do a lot of things with, with Ignite Wrestling Pro and plugged it already. We're, we're putting on a show in, in July um, Yay. With, with them. And uh one of the things I said to Andy at the end of, I, I'd never been, the first show I'd been to, we'd already agreed to to do the event with them and I'd never been. I went to watch their show in April and I come out and the first thing I said to Andy was, these guys that are, these guys and girls that are, that are resting in here, I, if they were called up the next day to like a Ring of Honor or a, a Progress or an NXT or anything like that, it wouldn't have surprised me because the yeah. talent on this card from like top to bottom, I took away, there was a couple of names I took away in particular that I would literally have said if, yeah, obviously not, there wasn't even in the main event, they were like the lower down on the card. And I sort of said, the, I mentioned like three names. And I said, if those three plus the top, of course, were, were tomorrow signed up, it wouldn't have surprised me. Has it sort of surprised you how good the talent are in, on, in, the, in British wrestling? <clears throat> I wouldn't say surprised. I would say, um, I wish they had a bigger scale and a bigger um, opportunity, you know, because you know, we always say here, and this is what we were talking about for the love of wrestling, that, you know, wrestling fans in the UK are just hungrier because they don't get it as often. It's not like, oh, I can go see any indie show or, you know, an indie show maybe, but like a uh, WWE house show, you know, they're coming, oh, they'll be here in a couple months um, for that reason. But I want to go back to what you just said. So by the way, because we're all friends here and we're being honest, what were your three? Uh, Harrison, <laughs> call him out, call him out. That's all right, I'll call him. That's fine. Uh, Harrison Leon was one, he was 6'6, six, six, 230. There was just something about him. Like, I was, I'll be honest, I mean, he's, he's kind of come on in a couple of years. I wasn't necessarily a fan of the, the gimmick side of what he, okay. you know, he was very like, I'm gonna throw money out, and it was all that, which was fine. You know, it's a, it's a kid's thing, which is cool. Sure. But when he got in the ring, mm, I was like, ring, okay, incredible. that was that was that was something, you know, when he got in the ring, the other guy was uh, Mark True. Uh, I think he was first on the card. I think he was first on the card. He, uh, he was, yeah. the, the guy that he was wrestling lives in Canby. I, well, he used to live in Canby like I do now. Where, I, uh, But again, he was just one that just, when he come out, when the way that he wrestled, he captivated what was great. And uh, the other guy um, was one of the guys I was just talking to, Taylor James. Uh, was he was on, I was literally doing a podcast with him just now. And again, it was the way that he presented. He's he's the antagonist. He's the heel. He does all that. But they were doing the things that like they had a uh, the match called. It was the bitter end. The pay per view was the bitter or the pay per view. The event was called the bitter end. They yeah. had this match that was called the bitter end because these two had been feuding ever since Ignite had started. Yeah. Uh, and the referee was the owner of Ignite that Taylor James retired uh, as part of the. You know, he actually le legitimately retired. He had to, but Taylor James retired him. Gotcha. And we, in, I interviewed him before the show and he was like, I'm going to go to Nino's family and I'm going to like literally bring, and he literally done that. I mean, the, the guy who was facing Nino Bryant was there. 
his whole family was there and he was taking Nino over there and he was doing stuff that I would literally think wow like I would imagine that on like a you know WWE because that's what they do they bring yeah. their family there and they mm-hmm. get involved you know that, that and it yeah. was just the way that he carried himself uh, and around the way to ring and these guys that you know they've wrestled probably a good few times but it was like and uh Taylor James is actually the tag champion in Apex he is, yeah. There you go. Yeah, he is. He is. Well, the, the reason I ask is because, like you just said, you know, to surprise you, that's what's so fun about, and it's it's actually kind of nice for me. And I say this to Ollie all the time, my commentary partner with Progress. Like, it's actually nice that I'm not like I wasn't there for they they call it the Peckham era and all these kind of shows that I was not a part of, and I've had to go back and watch, and they were amazing. But it's nice to see it with fresh eyes because I'm I don't have any bias at all, right? So. Okay. Like what you just said, when someone comes out and they have star quality and they have like you know that they're they're TV ready is what we would call it, right? Yeah. Um, that's really interesting to me. So like, for example, I have favorites in progress and I, I'll name, I, I don't want to play favorites, but I'm just naming a few that when I was like, oh my God, I want to see more of them. You know, Charles Crowley comes to mind, Spike Trevay, Doris, there's Dan Maloney. There's so many good ones that I'm just like, I, I have a very, very long list. Uh, Nina, you know, um, I mentioned earlier, Millie, uh, Lizzie Evo, there's so many great ones, Alexis, that like really get it. And and I just go, I mean, there's, again, I'm naming just a few, so I don't want to be favoritism but mm-hmm. there's so many that i just go wow they're so tv ready and they're so polished already that if this is them now imagine if they had you know wwe behind them with all that comes with being a wwe superstar so it's really nice to see kind of the new flock of wrestlers that are up and coming and you can pretty much spot them pretty quickly if you've watched wrestling long enough to go like okay he gets it and there mm-hmm. there's always room for growth you know some people are, are a bit green i certainly was and i watch back and i go oh my god i could have done this and this and this we're always our worst, worst critic, right? But um, it's nice to see such star quality um, on these shows around England because you think, wow, we're going to be watching these people in the next few WrestleManias or, you know, when, yeah. when they actually hit their stride and when they've gotten that. And hopefully they all have the confidence because a lot of them, I find that funny too, that it's interesting to me because, yeah, we all can be insecure, but a lot of wrestlers don't really understand how good they are. They sort of mm-hmm. question themselves. And I'm like, I have to be backstage going, are you kidding? That was yeah. amazing. Like, I'm just telling you that, well, I get, we do it to ourselves, I suppose, but I'm like, that irks me when they don't understand how great they are. I'm like, I wish I could just shake them and go, dude, you're a star. Like, just run with it. Have mm. confidence, you know? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Uh, just really quickly about switching gears. I was chatting to a, a wrestling friend of mine today. Uh, he was a big fan of Impact uh, Impact Wrestling. Um, yeah. And we uh, recently in the in the news, and I, 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 I knew you were coming on tonight. I'm really interested to get your views on this. Recently in like all over social media, it's a kind of a double-edged question. With the way that social media is nowadays within wrestling, it's, it's changed. For me and Adam mentioned this all the time. For mm. us to find out the raw results, we used to have to go on WWE.com and mm-hmm. see what had happened because it wasn't live over here. What role do you think that social media now plays in professional wrestling? Um, you've seen certain uh, female wrestlers in the WWE recently being hounded at airports for autographs and stuff like that. I mean, I, I see good and bad in professional wrestling on social media. And obviously someone like yourself, you know, I mean, I, I mean this in every complimentary way. You're an attractive woman. You're involved in wrestling. What role do you especially for you personally what role is social media now playing in wrestling for you Did I just uh, I love you blush. i'm too much i'm sorry for <laughs> winking uh no it's a great question honestly it's funny because that's actually one of my like go-to you know you have like your bullet list questions like at a comic-con yeah. for example and i always ask is social media helpful or harmful it's definitely both um but what i what i think it is no matter what and and if maybe some people are inept or um i don't know uh, they're not part of this but it's necessary Mm. period um i'll tell you a quick little story about so this is in every industry so modeling acting whatever unless you're like leonardo dicaprio who by the way does have a twitter he mostly uses it for activism but even leonardo dicaprio has a twitter (laughs) so if you don't i don't know who you think you are but come on anywho my point is i did a a bridal shoot one time i was modeling in orlando and they the, 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 the photographer was really nice and he was like hey so just so you know it sounds kind of mean but he meant it in the nicest way he goes we were going to go with someone else and we didn't, we weren't sure if we wanted a redhead for the shoot, but we were sent your social media stats and your followers. And he goes, we had to hire you because we knew you would tweet about today and about the company and the, the brand, the dress line we were, you know, photographing and the bridal company. And that's why I got the job. I didn't get the job because I was the perfect body type or even the perfect hair color, whatever they wanted. I got the job because I'm very active on social media. And a lot of people think that's horrible in the acting community. They'll go, Oh, it's terrible. You that's the world, bro. I mean, I hate to say it, but that's what we're dealing with right now. So yeah. when a wrestler mm-hmm. is either above social media or just, and I'm like, dude, first of all, get over yourself. Do me a favor. 
You're at an 11. Can you dial it down to a four? Um, only reason I will say that that makes sense is if someone's character would potentially not be tweeting about the coronation and silly things, right? So I get that. I do get that. John Cena is a great example. John Cena is the perfect example of someone who's on Twitter, follows his fans, follows me, follows everybody. Follows us. Follows us. <laughs> there, there you go. And can I tell you something crazy? Mm-hmm. I saw him in Wales at Monopoly events, and he was yep. like, Al, I met him when I was 18, I did a commercial with him, and I was showing the picture, he was cracking up. Nicest guy ever. Amazing. And he's like, Val, he took my hands and he was like, I want you to know that I'm so proud of what you've contributed to the business. And I'm like, I've contributed what? You're John Cena. And he goes, I know all about the podcast, about Gaw TV. I've, you know, you're doing it. And I'm like, so this guy's not just following, by the way, willy nilly. He actually is, he has his finger on the pulse of stuff. It's really cool to see. Um, He gets it. And for wrestlers to be too cool for school and have social media, I guarantee you, if no one's seeing what you're doing, it, it's it's madness to me. I thought, I, I, okay, here's an example. I went to a show recently and two of the wrestlers that I wanted to do research on for commentary, I followed them and they had private social medias. And I thought, why? If you're, you know, Johnny wrestler and then your real name is Sam and Sam has a private page, more, you know, more power to you, keep it private. I have a very personal kind of line about, my real life and my family, I get very protective and weird because, you know, obviously with wrestling, as you just mentioned, there's a lot of like kind of um, intrusive fans. There can be, unfortunately, it's a bad group of apples, but there's also mostly nice people. But if the wrestler's name is Sam, he wants to have his private account. Great. But you as Johnny wrestler, you know, you, you would behoove yourself to have a social media that's showing your gym time, your, what shows are coming up, who's, who's your opponent coming up. Cutting your own promos. One thing I said to um, one of the wrestlers when I first started with Progress, she was kind of saying, um, oh, you know, I'm not sure if they're going to use me, blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure. If they, I guess I think they told her they didn't need an interview that day because we were doing different interviews. And it just was a time constraint. Right. And I said, can I tell you something? If this happened to me, go film your interview anyway. Go, go film yourself. Send it in. They mm-hmm. might use it. And that's something that for me, I, I don't wait on anybody to give me. I just I go and I do it. And for that reason, I think that's something that can be taught in in this day and age to just stop waiting for a promotion to promote you, promote yourself. Mm-hmm. And there are so many um, great examples of this. I will use the best example of this, Matt Cardona. Who's gonna social say, uh, media yeah. to his advantage. Mm-hmm. Jericho's great on social media. RJ City's one of my favorites mm-hmm. on social media. Mm-hmm. And that's, they're, they're always popping up on my timeline because they're always tweeting. They're always being themselves. It never seems forced. And for me, I feel like I know them. Oh, well, I do, but I'm saying like, if I was a fan, they're letting me into their lives in a very nice, cool way. Not personally, not like, also there's a lot of, it's a whole conversation too, but like being really negative on social media. I have a friend that's uh, a wrestler that she always, you know, keeps retweeting all of the hateful tweets. And I'm like, girl, if you don't respond, I would never see it. All I'm seeing is that you're bothered by the trolls. So just delete them or block them or let's yeah. keep it positive. Let's keep it light and yeah. use it to your advantage. You can get, you know, influencer jobs for having followers like that. So I think it's, I'm such a social media gal that I love it. And I just wish that people would, again, like wrestling, not take it so damn seriously. It's just a marketing mm-hmm. tool, man. You know? Yeah. I think- Listen, you think when I, when I tweet a photo of my salad that it gets as many likes as a, as a photo of my bikini, it's not rocket science. Let me just check my phone. Hang on a minute. Yeah. yeah hang on. I'll tell you. <laughs> it's not rocket science, you know, not, not, and you, you, there's also a level of comfortability, especially with yeah. closing and that, that shouldn't be something that you don't want to do. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. But if I enjoy doing a sexy photo shoot, as I always have, trying to live my Tori Wilson fantasy still to this day, and it makes me feel empowered, I want to post it, I'm going to post it, bro. Exactly. Yeah. I, I just think no. it's Marmite. I, I think it, it it goes through phases where I, I love it. I mean, I, I tweet every day on the on our podcast stuff. I always find something to tweet out. But I just don't like those, you know, and those comments that a lot of the, you know, majority of the women get it more than the men. And yeah. generally the men will just like literally retweet and just end them with a set, you know, a line or something like yeah. that. It just frustrates me when I see it. And, and I think Soraya gets it way more. I don't, know. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't. No, she does. Yeah, I I'm see just, it. Yeah. I mean, more than what I, maybe because it's there in a public image more, maybe, I don't know. And I just think like this guy has no clue or this person has no clue mm. what has happened. 
Yeah. What that tweet is going to do to they may be sending this tweet having a laugh and joke, but you don't know mm. the effects. Yeah. You know. Yes. Of what is going to happen? I, but if I might interject and say, yeah. and she, but you are you are so right. She, I think she gets it more than most. And and mm. I I have to say, and if you know her, she's just that type of girl. She 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 is so much fun to watch because she will once in a while you know call someone out and kind of like go like, hey, everyone yeah. look at this idiot, and yeah. that's great. But. What I say to, because I was in a, um, a Zoom call about um, with female journalists recently, and they were talking about what do you do, how do you let it, you know, not affect you. And I was like, well, everyone's been affected by it, you know. For for twenty five lovely comments, there might be one that goes, oh, she's let herself go, or oh, at, at an autograph signing recently, someone goes like, oh, are these all your pictures? I go, yeah, and then one guy goes, oh, this must have been a while ago, and I was like, because uh, I'm thirty seven and I'm ancient. Anyway, the point is. Did you, did you tell your husband did you tell your husband to get out of the queue sorry <laughs> did you tell your husband to get out the queue he's not that yeah man. yeah yeah Stop making comments. That, that, i charged the guy double it was fine. but my, my only advice there and i i hope that people will if they're watching this and i don't care if you're a, if you're someone who has two followers or you know two million my thing is and and, and the, the little wall and i guess i i have been kind of strong like that for a long time i think my mother is a good influence on me for that reason but she's a very strong woman but for me i always kind of go without sounding rude Anyone that says something nice, I appreciate. It's very nice of you. Thank you. Comment and you look great. Thank you. But good or bad, I don't have any. I don't want to say this politely. It's hard to have respect for someone that you don't know and that you don't respect. Mm, if yeah. my family and my friends or you guys are my buddies now, like if you were to say, "Hey Val, you did a good job," that means a lot to me because I know you and I trust your opinions. Yeah, um, if somebody else says that you did, thank you, but I, you're not in my life. I don't know you. Mm. And not to say a compliment doesn't mean anything, but especially an insult. I don't know anything about your life. You know nothing about me, yep. nothing about my family, who I am. So, with all due respect, your opinion mm. means nothing. Uh, One of the um, sorry, basically, with all due respect, your opinion, fuck off. That's yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that just, too. Yeah. And the block yeah. button is there, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I had um, I just put recently a little quick brief story. I um, I had we had I host an NFL podcast. And um, we had some people bashing us on on social media. And then I went and interviewed Terry Crews. At the end of the Zoom call, and it, this will stay with me forever, he said to me, oh, Andy, man. he said, Andy, that's one of the best interviews I've ever been interviewed on. That will stay with me forever. The, the yeah, amount of interviews that that man takes daily. And I sat down with him for 45, 50 minutes and interviewed him. And when the Zoom call finished, he went to me, Andy, Tremendous job, he said. I absolutely love because that. You, I, I will you always do that again. Opinion. Yeah. Exactly. I will just quickly touch room, on that. I mean... I'll, I'll just quickly touch on that. Sorry, yeah. I, I had I had two like that recently. Last week, I interviewed uh, Saraya's brother Zach. Uh, oh, he's and the, Yeah, and one of the things he said was, you know, I, I I don't do podcasts. He went, but I asked the people that you've already interviewed, what are you guys like? And yeah. they, you were lovely. You're super respectful. You're lovely. Yeah. You know, and that's why he done it. And then Bobby Fish at the end said, uh, we interviewed Bobby Fish Thursday last week. He's great. Too. And he said, the one thing that I liked about you, because he'd done a podcast, I think a day or two before, and he went, the one thing that you guys, I can take away from it was that you guys don't dig for shit. You nah. guys don't, you guys just, are not, you know, yeah. You guys oh are not God. in it for, you know, you guys are not in it. Obviously, you want people to tune in and watch the podcast, but you want them to watch it for the right reasons. You're not trying yeah. to get the scoop or trying to get people to shoot. You're yeah. just trying to enjoy and listen to the stories and respect me because you've done research on about yeah. stuff that perhaps people mm. wouldn't know about. Yeah. yeah. And, that, I, and that's, again, coming from someone that you respect. So that compliment means a lot. Yeah. Just in that same way, if you flip-flop it, you know, conversely, if somebody says something rude, again, they don't know you. Their opinion, mm. what does their opinion mean? It doesn't matter. It's yeah. not, it's not, they're not part of your inner circle. And that's what I think sometimes is lost on social media. And I, and I feel bad because I feel kind of like, maybe, I'm like, am I like a hardened, can I use the word bitch? I'm like, am I yeah, like yeah. a hardened bitch? But like, I just, I don't care unless mm. it's someone that I genuinely... When yeah. my mom ever, very rarely would come to a show, I was nervous. Or my husband, mm. I'm not nervous, but I just, because I care what they think. Um, you know, same thing with you guys. Like I had a, a Cara Buono who's on Mad Men and who I love, Stranger Things, she's Nancy's mom. She came to me backstage and I literally, when she left, I cried. Kurt Angle did the same thing to me. Kind of said like, hey, you do a really good job. I just want you to know, I'm not sure if anyone, you know, just want to say you do a really good job and you know, you're really just gave all these compliments. And I was like, oh my God, because I love and respect these people. And I think that's a really mm. great compliment. But again, conversely, the ones that say insult, it's like, dude. And yeah, then if you look exactly. at the, if you ever if you want to be crazy and go look at their profile, it's always like just hate to everyone, yeah. and uh, it's awful. Yeah, it it's is. Nothing it to is. do with you. Uh, Val, just finishing up. Uh, I know you host a many a wrestling comic cons and everything here in the UK. 
What's the one question, the weirdest question you've ever been asked at Comic Con? <laughs> at Comic Con, um, oh gosh, I don't know that it's at Comic Con. I would say, <laughs> how PG can we be here? Oh, you can say whatever you want. It doesn't matter. You can say whatever. I will you want. say, you know, so so I'll, I will speak for all of the females in wrestling, <laughs> especially those that have only fans, because the thing is, like. A lot of us, you know, we, we, we have our stores, we sell, sell autographs and kiss print cards and whatever. We have only fans. And again, my, my advice for that is kind of like, you do what you're comfortable with. There are some girls who do adult content. It's not for me, but God bless. As long as you're safe and having fun, cool. You know, you do you. Boo. But we do get asked a lot of weird, weird things. And there was a gentleman uh, that wanted uh, to buy um, photos of me in the abdominal stretch. There's another guy that wanted to sell, like wanted me to sell like my used trash bags, and at first I was like no, and then I went okay for eight thousand dollars. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah. we, we, we get a, we get a lot of weird requests, and here's an example. So even in L.A., there was a um, my girlfriend and I. One, she's a wrestler in L.A., and she was sending me these requests. That people, I mean, there, there's like there's there's groups that girls post like the funny stuff that we get, and just in terms of like the fetish community, sorry to get weird, but like yeah. there's a fetish for everything. Yep. There were people asking female wrestlers and models to squish bugs in designer high heels. So first of all, that's not nice. Bugs have little lives and hearts too. Bugs love mine. Secondly, mouth. why does that do it for you, bro? Like even people <laughs> with feet, feet, great. Feet, feet are, that's fine. But when it gets to be something like, like squishing bugs, like, are you all right? Did your mother, like, I don't know. <laughs> have bugs done something to you that you want to see their demise under it? Why is it to be a designer high heel? That's just weird. Yeah, don't, don't want to ruin them designer high heels. But um, yeah, I know. But, it, it, but it's been absolutely tremendous. It's been the best hour that I've had this oh, week so far. I, I love it, that we're it, ending it, on that. That's weird. Uh, yeah, what, what a, a way to end. end. <laughs> what a way to end. What a story to end on the bug lives. Um, but Val, thank you so much. It does mean a lot to us. I know you're extremely busy, but you are one of the most, and I say this, uh, you know, we've interviewed lots of people. Yeah. You're one of the most approachable people in the wrestling industry. You said oh, at the start you. of the show that you, you know, you are this bubbly person. You are this very in your face. Mm -hmm. Never change being that. That's what we oh, all. Thank you so uh, much. Just, and I can just speak as a fan, as someone that's met you, and you, you're my neighbour now. You're only in Milton Keynes. Oh, I know. Never change. Keep being like that. The world need. I always. The world needs more people like you. Well, I would say the same to you guys. Honestly, this has been so much fun. I can always tell it's a great conversation when I don't even know what time it is. Yeah, and if I can have any city little... standards now. Yeah. <laughs> We are. I'm a drag race team. Come on. But if any, any, I'll do a final plug. I'll just say thank you guys for uh, obviously for having me. And if you guys, since you're already here on YouTube, Grown Ass Women TV is with myself, Mickey James, and Lisa Marie Barron. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. in the UK every Wednesday. And by the way, people forget this point of it. Um, we're actually in the live chat every Wednesday. So if you guys want to come watch a show, and we've got, uh, we just had Shane Helms on, we've had Kurt Angle, Mick Foley, right. DDP, everybody. So watch our show, subscribe to this show, and support your local indie wrestling and everyone that loves wrestling like we do. So thank you guys for your contributions to the business as well. Uh, no problem. No problem. Adam. Well, I, I can only say, uh, and I've mentioned it before, we're getting ready for buckle up. Uh, we July are. 23rd uh, at Boreham Wood. Um, but I've got a to interview just incredible uh, uh, Thursday. Uh, yes, uh, I get to do that Thursday. And Sunday, I get to do an NWA uh, interview with AJ Kazana, poolside on his birthday. Uh, of, so he's going to said he's happy to spend his birthday talking to me and one of our other lovely co-hosts, uh, Fiona Lochran, who does Inside the Ropes. Uh, and just quickly before we go around, I know we're getting pushed for time. Uh, Inside the Ropes magazine, uh, if you get it this month, you may see uh, something called Buckle Up in there. Uh, I don't know what that is, Andy. I don't know what we're doing. but uh, Some event we're hosting, yeah, okay. mate. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Come and Y'all check it out. This, yeah, we love are to Fiona, to... too. Mwah. Give her my love. Yeah, we do love Fiona. But... Uh... Val, thank you so much. Uh, we wish you every success in anything you do. I hope to catch you at a future Apex show. I may even yeah. see you walking around the shopping centre in Milton. <laughs> I'm knows? usually in Harrods. If you want to find me, I'm either getting oh, my hair done in Harrods. We ain't on that much money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of the Hit in the Turnbuckle podcast. I've been your host, Andy Burrows, with my amazing friend, Adam Cousins. Till next time, everybody, buckle down. Stay safe.